you know, it's a sad time in a way to not be able to do, um, you know, to be not, not able to do the episodes face to face anymore. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, sad because, you know, you can't gig at the moment. Um, or maybe you can't. <laughs> <bow. laughs> no, <laughs> no. Well, oddly enough, we've got um, Tom Kerridge, you know, the chef. Yeah. Yeah, he's the saviour. He's um, he's organised some uh, drive-in outdoor shows, and uh, I'm doing one on September the sixth with my band, the whole oh, rock band. Yeah, Hen Henley on Thames. And, uh, and what? So, so he's going to get. He's he's sort of. How come he's organising it? Is he doing like picnics and stuff for people or something like that? Yeah, um, it, for years he's. <sighs> So I'm just squeezing the life out of a tea bag. <laughs> I need a cup of tea, and I'm here alone. I'm not. <laughs> Sorry, wait. Um, yeah, for quite a long time, he's organised. Well, production companies do it for him, of course. Um, called Pub in the Park, and they, they get five and seven, eight thousand people, and he has some big names on. I've done about three or four of those in the past. And he's invited me to play this one, uh, Henley on Thames. It's just me and Squeeze, which is quite an interesting bill. Right, that, that'll be that'll be a great bill. Um, yeah, lot lot of hits. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. And uh, so, so will, will that be? You know, that will be the first gig for a while then. Since yeah, we we did nine with the un, un, the uncovered album. Uh, we're touring with that album, of course, and. Yeah, it's a four-piece acoustic band, and um, we played nine in February and March. We were on fire. It's great players, great players, having such a great time. And uh, then, you know, the door got slammed in our faces. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's horrible, to be honest, Tom. It's, um, it's uh, close, to de close to depressing, but that's not my style, but it's close to it. Yeah, but you've got, so do you have rescheduled dates and stuff? With, with yeah, 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 I'm not. Huge, I, you have a huge tour booked, right? Yeah, Long yeah, I always, yeah. Yeah, I'm not a cancellor. I, uh, I, I'll i postpone if it's, we've rescheduled every single one of about 57 shows for wow. next year, including Finland, Belgium, Holland, as well as about 50 in the UK. So all rescheduled. Uh, and and the great thing is that my UK ones uh, for this year, 92, 93% sold, uh, wait, you know, nine months in advance, eight months, six months. So they're all going to sell out. And um, the, the good news is promoters report back that they've had like two people ask for their money back. <laughs> you know, like they're going to be on holiday when we reschedule for next June or July. Uh, it's that's, minuscule the number that's so good though that, yeah. uh, that people are you know, it's really gratifying hang on to their tickets and stuff because do you yeah. do, you, do you foresee well i mean presumably that that's a an, a, a sign of optimism because it because some people obviously saying you know maybe it'll be difficult to sell tickets to gigs maybe people will be scared of large gatherings and stuff i kind of feel like the opposite i think everybody wants to get back out there and enjoy enjoy music and i'll tell you what i've found that is really gratifying how much a fan, sorry, just a generic word for a person who buys tickets to live shows, how much they love it. I didn't know. I mean, I, I come out of the wings, the light hits me and I'm a performer. Um, you know, I adore the job. I totally love it. And I'm quite good at it. I've been doing it for so long. It's just, it's a job. I, I adore the job. And I, people like me, I think, react to the night, on the night, to that crowd. And then you go to a hotel room and sleep it off. And you do it again the next day. They go home and they might not see another live show, not mine, it could be anybody, for three months, six months, whatever. A month, some go a lot. So they... It's an event. It's a job for me. Of course, it's an event once the light hits, once the, once the ear, my in-ear monitors blast. Oh, yeah. 
oh yeah, I'm a hundred percent serious. And anyone who's seen me play, they know that. I play every show, every show, like it's the last I'll ever do on this earth. And they're writing in Facebook and the website to let me know. It's getting very intimate, much more than I've been. All my career, I've had arm's length with people. I swear to you, I'm very private. I'm quite scared of the public. And yeah, I think it's to do with my leg, you know, the, the polio, the scared of people getting too close and pushing and I'll fall over. Things, yeah, that, it's probably a psychological problem from my childhood. But I'm very arm's length. And here I am getting quite intimate um, even talking to you at this moment, it's as though I've known you forever. I'm not guarded. I'm just not guarded. I choose my words carefully because I like the English language, but I'm not guarded. I'm not bothered anymore. I've got nothing to hide. It just strikes me life is too short after all. But they write these wonderful eulogies and they say, to me personally, that they're saying, you know, we can't exist without live music. Without your show, Steve, we, you know, we need you. And I just uploaded last night uh, uh, on Facebook on my, Greta runs it for me. I wouldn't know how to upload a film. But she uploaded, I, I filmed myself in my living room with a guitar. I play all the time. I play. In these four months, five months has it been, who knows. I've played a monstrous amount of guitar because I have to keep match fit. I never knew that Tom Kerridge was going to come into our lives for September the 6th, but it could happen and it did happen. I've got to be match fit. I've yeah. not put an ounce of weight on and my fingers are still guitar players' fingers. <laughs> and I uploaded a wee film playing some open tuning, new experimental tunings that I'm working on. And the response today is fantastic. They, they, they just say, that we want more, we need your playing. And I'm not going to do half-hearted gigs in my living room i'm not doing that i've seen some of them and it's just come on yeah we've all got we've all got to wait for the real thing yeah but this was a this was a one-to-one -one intimate thing not pretending to play a concert yeah. yeah i mean nothing can replace that that uh that feeling and and it's well it's it's really nice to hear of that that kind of change that it's you know helped you let your guard down and and, and stuff <laughs> <laughs> Like that's, that's a positive to be gleaned from a from an you know an unfortunate yeah. situation, and all music lovers want to get back out there and and watch gigs. That there's it's it really just feels like there's something so lacking with life. And as you say, some people do only go to a gig every few months. So I yeah, it's yeah. Just... But for to a to a punter, a member, a member of the public, to go four or five times a year, thirty quid a ticket, sixty five quid for the big shows. It's a lot of money and a lot of planning, maybe a hotel room, but it's, we're of an age, you know, not the Ed Sheeran fans, but mine and the vast majority of concert buying public, I would think are of an age where they can afford it. And it's a, 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 an adventure. Well, we live that adventure. Getting on a tour bus is still, and saying hello to six, seven blokes, maybe 12 if the crew, crew are there as well sometimes, and just to say hello, it's, a, it's thrilling. You're amongst what people like, the expression is like-minded people. And you're off somewhere. Where are you, you know, you meet up at South Mims, you park, we all park there for maybe two weeks at a time to board a 12 bunk, luxurious sleeper bus, you know, luxurious uh, nightliner. And I don't sleep in it very often. <laughs> I need hotel beds. <laughs> But it's a great adventure and we live it. I mean, to be honest, without a ticket, I've been doing it for 47 years and without a ticket, an itinerary, a tour manager banging on all, all day long, without those things and a trolley bag packed, I really don't know who I am. I mean, without seeing my kids for two months and my grandchildren for two months at the beginning of this, I truly didn't know who I am. It took my son, who's a lawyer, God knows, oh, he's very, very the, um, worldly for a young man. He, and it took him to, to explain to me that it's on hold and you're still the person they think you are. But I, I couldn't recognize myself. And it, it, until I was seeing the children again, and we have for the last six or seven weeks, 
it's you know we see each other every other weekend we live in Suffolk and they live in Hertfordshire and London my kids but to see them come here to this we've got a big house here and a couple of acres behind me of beautiful woodland it's lovely yeah it's, it's fabulous I know how lucky I am I mean I'm not sting rich but <laughs> but, I, but I've done very well and uh to have them as given me back my sense of being, of knowing who I am. Uh, I'm a father, I'm a grandfather, but the boy, the kid who's four and a half, he dances to me with the guitar. His guitar's all around my house. There's three or four set up on stands. I never stop playing. So he comes and he loves music. He's a great little dancer, very, very musical. And so I realize again who I am. And then I, just before talking to you, I, I played this afternoon for the first time in a couple of weeks, three weeks, four weeks, I played Uncovered, my, my rather fantastically recorded album. Thank you, Matt yeah. Butler. And I play it on a Lin system. It's a 50,000 quid uh, hi-fi. Lin, yeah? You'd know Lin. Yeah. And it's, it's just phenomenal. Lin's system, like name, they take no prisoners and you, what you record is what you hear. And wow. And I played this album and thought, oh, wow, Christ, the quality here. It's the finest recording I've ever made. And you've probably heard and read, there's absolutely, absolutely no EQ. Yeah, yeah. Not a, not a drop. And and you know you can once you've been t I I was told that before I listened to it so I was kind of like already uh -huh. keeping keeping uh, you know my ears out for it. And, did uh, Did you hear it? Are you hearing it on a good system? Uh, I, I I must well I, okay. I was just listening to it on a pair of Bose he headphones, so it wasn't you know. Hey, okay, yeah. They, they were good, but no, nothing like what, what you're describing. Um, but well, it, uh, it sounded fantastic to me. I was just listening to I've I've just seen a face, which is one of my favourite songs as well. Uh, I, I love I loved your version of it. So, and, <laughs> Thank and, you. Yeah. And uh, so was this this is the first is this the first um, you know LP you've made for for like ten years? Is that right? <laughs> uh, it needs the um, the Harley nerds to confirm that, but I expect they'll tell you that. Yeah, there, there's people who know far more about my career than I do. Lots of them. Um, is it 10 years? Stranger Comes to Town? Yeah, yeah. I ten, don't know. 10 years ago. How well, do you know what? Get back in the studio. It feels like a new album. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard work, Tom. Uh, as you get older, um, I'm not materialist. I'm pretty level-headed. I, I, I put people first, big time. I'm not materialist, but... I have a wonderful art collection, wonderful, really, really good. A lot of, um, they're not Manet or Monet or Cezanne, but they are high quality uh, Impressionism. Paul Horton, um, collect, I'm, a, I'm a collector of Paul Horton's pastels. It's a lovely, my house is covered. It's a beautiful, when I bought this property, six bedroom Georgian coaching in, the owners didn't have a picture on the wall or a book on a shelf. It's ridiculous, it, honestly yeah. astonishing. And they were both school teachers. <laughs> it's like an art gallery, you know, the passages and the rooms, everybody, uh, it's just so attractive and beautiful and, you know, the artwork and that. But uh, in a fire, I only save people, you know, understand? Maybe one guitar. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know where that came in. I'm rambling <laughs> a bit, I don't know. It's... <laughs> No, not not at all. Um, but but so, I, and also, I mean, I guess you know, the, and, and and again, your your fans w would would be able to confirm it. But you know, it's actually quite quite sporadic. Like your your work in the studio since your classic run of, of albums in in the seventies. That's where I can. That's what I was saying, isn't it? That's where the, the, as you get older and you've got the pictures on the wall. Yeah. You, you've, you, when you've got what you, you've acquired, acquired what you set out to acquire, which is good fortune, let's say, and I've had that. A fabulous wife, uh, great children. And when you've got all that, it's very hard to write something deep and meaningful. 
you know i don't want tragedy in my life i've had enough in my uh, for myself but i don't need it i don't want it i live a safe i bet i own racehorses and i bet most days of the year but i'm not a gambler i'm not a gambler i protect my myself and my family and it's very hard to write lyrics i write tunes all the time all the time i mean 80 90 tunes are on the iphone on itunes oh maybe more try writing a lyric that li would live alongside some of what I've, i'm proud to say i've written Whew. it's tough it's tough because i'm not angry i am with a lot of life of course i'm angry at the moment with this damn bug yeah i'm angry i'm angry at not knowing what the future holds of course i am but so is everyone else Every, every interview I've done in the last two weeks, not everyone, half a dozen have said, oh, that sounds like a good theme for a song. And I said the other day to someone, look, man, every songwriter on planet Earth is writing about this bug. Yeah. They don't need it. You don't need another one. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> yeah, and I think probably a lot of people want, want um, music to be a release from, from, from this. Uh, from the chat about about the virus you know as, yeah. as important as it is though for us to get it off our chests you know yeah. a, lot of a lot of people before you can even open your open your mouth and say say whatever about how frustrated you are with the virus people are like i don't want to talk about it and actually sometimes it's like but i want to have a rant about how annoyed i am <laughs> <laughs> a ranting's good yeah. ranting's good i said to in front of my wife who is much more um, aware of this problem than I am. I'm pretty, pretty often. I saw my dear mate Rod Stewart in Liverpool just before Christmas. I went to see Cat Stevens in Brussels three or four years ago. He's my old friend, Yusuf. I don't go to. I don't go to them. I don't go to them. I see a lot on YouTube, but I don't go out to them. I go to the theatre quite a lot. Dorothy and I go down to the West End and see uh, about seven or eight times a year we go to the theatre. Um, but I said to her in front of my children, in, in front of her, I said, as soon as I know there's either a vaccine or this bug doesn't hit anybody anymore, viruses die. I mean, you're young, a lot younger than me. I've lived through polio and suffered from it, of course, but survived it. Diphtheria, TB, all those various crazy flus Yusuf had TB. So there you are. Yeah. Um, whew, we've lived through them, man. They were all killers. And here we are. It's going to fade. It's weaker and weaker and weaker by the day now. So I said, I would be quite prepared. And I'm Mr. I haven't had a common cold for 30 plus years because I'm a singer. I, I do it every night when I'm out there. So I don't catch a cold. I won't let them near me. I smell a cold. I sniff a cold backstage when we walk into a venue. If one of the sound crew, the theater crew has any, I, I, my antenna, I go like this. <laughs> I pick up their germs from 30 meters and I say, got a cold? Or I send my tour manager or roses, got a cold? Oh yeah, I'm terrible. I'm up and <laughs> out of here, out of here. You don't come near the crew. You don't go backstage. You don't go within 10 yards of Steve Harley because he does this tomorrow. He can't catch your horrible, dirty germs. You were saying that, you know, you, you'd be happy. To, you, you know, you kind of think it's, if, I, I, if I'm understanding you correctly, are you, you, you kind of think, you know, people should be able to go out and, and, and go to concerts and stuff and just kind of. Well, well not right now. No, obviously not right now, but as the figures come down and down and down, yeah. no one's dying anymore. Uh, I was live on the Jeremy Vine show about a month ago um, because my wife had lost an old auntie in Glasgow. She was 89. She went into hospital with brain cancer and serious dementia. And we knew she wouldn't come out. But three days later, she passed away. Then they slapped COVID-19 on her death certificate. The family were furious. She, that didn't kill her. And I, was, I got fed up with it. And I called um, my PR people and said, look, call, try and get me on with Jeremy Vine to talk about this. And Jeremy knows me. He, he, he 
came straight back and said, brilliant, love it, Steve, love it. And so there we were, live on air with me saying, I want the truth. I want the truth. 35 at that time, thousand people have not died from coronavirus. It's just not true. You're including how many thousands of people in their late 80s and 90s who, who have really bad illnesses. I mean, they might pick it up in that hospital at that time. This was weeks ago. Yeah. But, but and I understood the NHS, the stress meant they couldn't do a post-mortem. They couldn't always work out exactly what the cause of death was. Coronavirus. Well, I said to Jeremy, look, I take these matters seriously. And so do a lot of people in that they, they, the genealogy, the family history matters to them. And when grandchildren today, children, when they're older and they, they, they go through the family records and they work out who was what in their family, it's an interesting subject. They're going to say old Auntie Mabel died of coronavirus in 2020 when that stupid rotten bug was about. No, she didn't. No, she didn't. And now... You know, this is weeks after I started the ball rolling. I think I might have been inst instigated it. I don't know. I won't take credit. But it, I'd never heard anyone say this before. And Jeremy got the, the, the public were calling him in saying, I've just been listening to Steve. Co completely agree. It happened in my family. And it stirred up a hornet's nest. Now they're having to come clean. And they're saying, actually, 10 to 12% of those recorded deaths. Uh, yeah, fancy that. Yeah. So you know, it's, it's, not, it's. I heard that it was a lot higher than 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 that percentage as well. Of, oh, is it? I'd like to think so. I, I I heard it was as high as as eighty or ninety percent. Um, I I like. I, I mean, I would advise you know anybody to actually look into it, and and certainly I need to look into it again. But I heard it was a, a huge proportion of of the deaths being recorded have another underlying cause yeah yeah more serious yeah yeah it's just and me what me, meanwhile tens of thousands of people are, are not getting their cancer treatment and their appointments yeah. with doctors it is disappointing that other other problems are kind of being swept under the rug as a result it's a terrible thing it, it, it's wrong that it takes completely <laughs> over i'm sure it's wrong yeah. Anyway, enough. Hope, hope, hopefully, it won't for a long time. But anyway, back to music. Yeah. <laughs> so, you're, so you you had a run of albums in the seventies that are you know some some of the best stuff that came out in the seventies. It you know and 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 all of it is really good. You know all of the music that you released. Um, Thank you. All of the records and. You know, right from the human menagerie, you know, all, all the way to the candidate in 1979. You know, what a run! Um, Thank you. Yeah, yeah. And and so, what you know, this is this probably is a question that you've been asked before. Um, but obviously, you know, the first time I ever heard a Steve Harley record, I was probably about ten or something, and I heard "Make Me Smile." Does that annoy you? That how much over the years that song has? Because you hear that, you hear that on the radio. Does that do, do, does it ever annoy you how much it overshadows sometimes all those great albums? Like probably mm. in the seventies, people weren't. It it probably wasn't such a thing in the seventies. Probably ev everybody had the records in the seventies, and and obviously there are still loads of people now who love them and appreciate them. But in terms of you know, make me smile is on the radio. But it's probably yeah. on the radio, uh, uh, probably on every single like radio station like right now playing. It's just you hear yeah, it. Yeah. It's all around the world, as I, I know. Um, I wish I had 10 of them. <laughs> no, it's a, it's a phenomenon, this, the record. It's phenomenal. Um, but I, I'm, I, you know, I'm philosophical about it. The, the albums mostly have sold very well. Look, you know, my life is playing live. There's no money in making a record anymore. You know, I spent a lot of money on un on the Uncovered album. It's topped Rockfield for two weeks, Air in London, Engineer, the best musicians. It's cost my company a lot of money to make that. PR people, you know, radio pluggers, all the, you know, all the bills. It's a lot of money. And I probably won't ever get it back, but that's not the point. The point is that I'm out there and... It will sell for years on the road. We sell a huge amount of stuff, merchandise, playing concerts. 
And when I, I was in a car park, you know, for the first two months of lockdown, the highlight of my week was taking Dorothy to eight miles to Sudbury in Suffolk to a supermarket. Uh, and I, it was such glorious weather. And I'd sit outside in the car park. I don't go in supermarkets. And I, I, I had the door, door wide open. I'd be doing the crossword, watching horse racing maybe, generally just getting on with life. And a guy came up at one point who recognized me, the door was on, and he said, oh, you know, love your new album. And I said, oh, thank you. Um, trying to make a bit of not small talk, I said, have you got the CD or, or the vinyl? Because it sold a lot of vinyl. And he said, I downloaded it. And I said, oh, it's interesting. What's that, like a 75p a track or something? That's, that's interesting. So you carry it around on your phone. And then he, got a, he had to own up. And he said, well, actually, I uh, streamed it. I said, what does that mean? He said, Spotify. Well, I've heard of it. And uh, I came back, I, I came home and started to investigate this streaming stuff. So he hears my album. If he hears 10, 10, 10 tracks for 10 quid a month he pays and he can hear any, any music on planet Earth, apparently. And I get 0. 0.004 of a penny. I think it's actually 0. 0.0004. Even less, yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's astonishing, isn't it? It's immoral. Uh, it's immoral. Um, it's just too too stupid. It's just wrong. And I, uh, I'm I'm looking into it. I I'm not sure I'm going to allow them to have access to my tracks. I'd rather die broke than think people were stealing from me. That's like getting mugged. I'm, I'm not having that. Yeah. Well, I think I think it's. Um... Yeah, I, I, I wish I wish more high profile artists, um, you know, kind of felt that way in a way, because like, I mean, like the, of, of the people that I've interviewed so far, it was only Crosby who, who felt the same way about that. David Crosby. Otherwise, yeah. everybody, otherwise, everybody has kind of just sort of said making a record now is just marketing expense. You can't make any money. No, it's, it's a pointless exercise. So what will happen is. You, you, you've pointed out that I've taken 10 years before releasing an, uh, an album. I well, mean, this could be why. In, in... Yeah, well, it wasn't why, but now that I'm wised up, oh, it's, it's, it's heartbreaking. It's just wrong, wrong, wrong on every level. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because it, it, just, it just means that, um, you know, people people with talent, I guess, are gonna are gonna kind of think, you know, the record business. Don't know. There's literally no money in it, and uh, and it's well, quite it, irksome. I'm not gonna make a rubbish record. I'm not gonna do it. I went. To, I've just said to you. I went to Rockfield. I, I I've paid the best musicians money can buy. Uh, you've heard the quality that we, we of this this record, this product. Superbly engineered. It, I mean, engineered it, to the point where you didn't need to use any EQ. No, I mean it's it's just brilliantly recorded by Matt. It's um, we, you know, but I and we had a lot of fun, and everyone was very well paid. But if I'm not going to break even after three or four years of it, even to, like with touring and selling it on the road as we do, we've got a merchandise guy with us. And why would I make another one? I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a charity. People have got to understand. They keep saying, why don't you make more records? Well, I tell you what, Buster, it's because you don't pay for the ones I do make. You put it on your Spotify account, 10 quid a month, and you hear them for nothing. Um, yeah. We don't get anything. It's just, it's, it's <laughs> sorry, but it, my simplistic look at this is very reasonable. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's impossible to disagree, to, to disagree with you. I mean, I guess it could. It's, well, it is, you know, you can't tell people that they've got to work for, you know, hundreds of hours on, on, on a recording, put their heart and soul into it, um, put, their, put their financial resources into, into making it possible. And um, when you're the artist, you know, give lots of other people employment. Um, mm -hmm. And then yeah. and be told that, you know, um, yeah, loads of people can consume it, sure. Everybody can enjoy it. But no, you can't recoup any of your investment on it. That's actually... 
um, going to be Spotify. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Spotify. It, 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 it would become the equivalent of um, vanity publishing. You know, every, everyone, everyone and his grandmother's written a book, uh, you know, the family history as anybody cares. 50 people in the world care about you and your family history, I'm afraid. And their family. <laughs> oh, I've had a book published. Well, have you? Really? And what did it cost you? This vanity. I, in the music industry, you know, it might cost that person who's written their so-called book, might cost them 500 quid. My album's costing 35,000 of my company's money. Uh, I won't get that back. Not now there's streaming. I didn't know about it, to be honest. I just, <laughs> I'm quite out of touch with all that. It's not what I do. So do you, so do you still listen to, listen to music on, on CD and, and vinyl and stuff? Yeah, yeah, CDs pop through my litter box about 20, 30 times a year. My wife buys them, I order them. Uh, there's no record shops anymore. Although I played in one, when we were doing a residency for three or four nights in Holborn, uh, the Pizza Express, beautiful theater there, yeah. uh, in, Mar in Mar at February and March, uh, I did a, oh, I don't know what they're called. Um, there's a record shop in Covent Garden around the corner. It's got a very funny name, like Slop or Schwop or something, I don't know. And I went there and it was brilliant. About 100 and 120 people showed up for a selfie thing, you know, <laughs> and bought, bought the CD and assigned them and talked to people. What was it called, you know? So there are some record shops, um, but we order them online and it comes through the post the next day. I buy a lot of yeah, CDs, yeah. I, I drive a lot. I go around the country and I, 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 I play music. I play it on my Lin system. <laughs> what else? You know, yeah. I don't want to put streaming. It's all compressed. You're not even hearing it properly. Yeah. My, yeah. My, my, my son is a bit of an audiophile. He tells me there is one whose name escapes me. It's the high quality one that uses master recordings. Uh, that, I can't remember the name of it, but is it the one? I think there was one started by Neil Young that, where, where it was. Oh, I don't know. I think it might only, He says uh, there's only one. Yeah, I think it must be that one then. It's like with a focus on actually, you know, using the master. Using the master properly. Yeah, but the others, they're all compressed. And it was very nice of this guy to come up and tell me how much he liked my new album. But he wasn't even hearing it, you know, truly. Um, yeah, it's, well, it's, it's a frustrating time. But I mean, on the, on the plus side, you, d you did, you know, you, you made you know, the bulk of your recorded uh, material was made during an era when people um, appreciated the, you know, the LP as an art form more because they weren't inundated with so much content for 10 quid a month. Everybody can access every single album to find, to find the focus even, focus on like one CD or one, or one uh, LP in the way that people used to. It's like nigh on impossible. Um, when you're confronted with every single song in recorded history for free. Um, make your own, what they call it, make your own playlist, I don't know. Yeah. Um, vi vinyl is becoming popular again and people are buying yeah. decks. Yeah, I, I hear some lovely stories, lovely stories about vinyl from the 70s when I meet people, what it meant to them, taking the human menagerie or psychomodo to school <laughs> under their arm, the sleeve, the, 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 you know, the cover. You get some nice stories. It's uh, very touching. Yeah, and that tactile, that tactile, um, you know, experience, it ca you know, can't be replaced with with streaming. So, and and, and you know, I'd imagine as well that uh, you know, uncovered, that you, your fan base will have will have um, wanted to get that on vinyl. You know. Yeah, it's done very well, and what we have offered, and I've signed, because it's like the big twelve-inch thing, and it's black, with the silver picture in the middle. It lends itself to the big silver paint stick uh, signature in the top left corner. And the story is that many, that we've sold hundreds, hundreds that I know about, um, many of them apparently don't play vinyl. They just need to know they've got it and I sign it and they frame it. It's not that sweet? <laughs> it's, it's, on, it's on the wall, it's a work of art. This great sleeve, it's a fantastic photograph. Yeah, uh, 
taken in Holland, uh, an acoustic show, and uh, this this for, for professional photographer he sent me, or my he sent to my my office about thirty shots from this gig, and they were all in colour, and they were all of a much of a muchness, and suddenly there was this black and white silvery thing <laughs> that apparently was an accident, and we j I just went that's it, that's it. How much do you want? What is it going to cost? You know, we, we did a deal with him and uh, just love it. It's a lovely sleeve, I've got to say. Yeah, it really <laughs> and is. signed with the silver stick. Uh, maybe it's <laughs> adorning a few hundred walls. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure I, I, Whatever it takes. Definitely uh, imagine uh, people, you know, without, without the players, without the, without the decks, just wanting to put that on the wall. Um, and and so so from from the album, so you went to you went to Air and you went to went to Rockfield to make it. When when did you when did you record Mostly it? Rockfield. Last year. You uh, oh, it was a year ago, last July. Uh, we, we were at Rockfield, in the sun. Yeah, it was gorgeous down there. It was wonderful, lovely time. Something something magic was in the air for all of us. It was a very special time. I mean, Martin Simpson. Guitar, just scary. Uh, they were brilliant musicians, and I, I had a wonderful time. And how did you choose the, tr the tracks? Um... Uh, well, it wasn't difficult. Um, they are all, I mean, two of them are mine, as you probably know, and yeah. nine of them are not. Um, but you must have had a backlog as well of your, your own songs, maybe that you'd, you'd wanted to. So but even narrowing down that to two, I can imagine. If, if, if you've got like 90 pieces of music, even just, you know, right now. And well, I know I'd, I, I knew that I wanted to, to make an, an album of interpretations of, of songs that have touched me deeply. I mean, you, you, you mentioned the McCartney and I've just seen a face. You know, he was a young man uh, madly in love with um, the actress. What's her name? The Bates Cakes now. Trishy Jean. Jane, Jane Asher. Jane Asher. And, you know, he, he talks, McCartney writes a beautiful narrative, like paperback writer. And in that song, he, he, he says, um, had it been another day, he talks about serendipity. Had it been another day, I might have looked the other way. And I'd have never been aware. But as it is, I'll dream of her eh, tonight. As it is, I'll dream of her as it is, what happened? Well, I did look. Had it been another day, I might have looked the other way. Well, yeah, that's serendipity. And it's a beautiful image. It's just bloody beautiful. And the whole song is so, so sensitive. I love doing it as a sort of bluegrass swing. I hope Paul likes it. Um, there's, they're all great songs, you know, Crispin who, who wrote uh, for the, um, I, I, I lost myself. It's just a magnificent song. Um, um, I've been singing it on the guitar since the mid '90s when it was a top ten hit, top twenty, top ten. And uh, we sent it to him, and he wrote back the nicest, the nicest um, of compliments. And so did Yusuf. He said the kindest things. And so did Errol Brown's family um, about Emma. So so gratifying, yeah. But the songs that they're songs that I've been playing for forever, Tom. That that I play all the time in in the house, and they're just songs. You don't play your own songs, you know. I'm rehearsed. I've, I've, I'm rehearsed. I've yeah. got, you know, my show could involve any number. Of the set list could be any one of twenty five songs out of about seventy five that I would play. So I know all them. So at home, to keep my fingers match fit, I, I, I play other people's songs. You know. And so, yeah, you must, have, you must have just, these must have been some of the ones that just had huge... Yeah, they, they were familiar to me. And, and out, out of Time was, was kind of close <laughs> with the single, right? The, the yeah. Stones track. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's number, it was number one in 66 for Chris Farlow when England were winning the World Cup, you know. So it's quite quite a significant hit record, but it's more than that. I mean, it's a Stones Jagger Richards song, and it's timeless, timeless. 
and playing it the way we do with that kind of bluegrass feel to it and a backbeat and gospel singers. It's interesting. The whole experience at Rockfields was Martin Simpson is from the world of roots music. Oh, so he's so good. I've got a duet with the phenomenal Eddie Reader. I mean, Eddie Reader is like an idol of mine. And we went to see her play in Stanford in Lincolnshire a year or two ago and met backstage. And I didn't know what she'd think. She's a, a Scottish folk singer, a roots mu musician. I didn't know what she'd think of Mr. Mainstream, like me. But she was an absolute sweetheart. And the first record she bought was the Psychomodo. Think about it. She said that to me. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. And she's the singer from heaven. Uh, she's gifted. And to have I, Eddie duet with me on that um, uh, Newfoundland uh, traditional song, Star of Belle Isle. And I found the two lost verses that I sing at the end with Eddie as a duet. They, they were lost. Very. I bet there's only one recording of them that we could find in ever. Uh, from, that was from the 1950s. And I found these two verses that I knew existed. <laughs> And she sings the duet with me. Um, I mean, what a great life. Uh, the, the, the rhythm section are both jazz players from the Royal Academy of Music, both jazzers. They'd never worked with someone like me. Uh, and I'd never worked with them or gospel singers. I mean, we were all pretty well, all of us, if you single each person out on that album. Uh, even the, cla the the string quartet from in Holland. We went to Holland to record the four quartet pieces with quartet on they're young dutch people uh, they that all they knew about me was sebastian they know that because it's huge there and it's got the classical arrangement <laughs> and uh, everyone's out of their comfort zone it's experimenting and uh, everyone seemed to enjoy that they're musicians hey they're musicians very very broad-minded people uh, well you can you can hear it on the record that it, it, it just sounds like it was a lot of fun to make and, and Good. It, yeah, yeah. Uh, also, yeah just, just remarkable the way it was recorded and um, so uh, Steve I really appreciate you taking the time to do this podcast so m my final question to you is obviously the podcast has has the tongue-in-cheek name greatest music of all time who who are the greatest <laughs> who are the greatest in, um, to you who, who, you know who who are your greatest of all time Smokey Robinson Stevie Wonder, Frank Zappa. Zappa is out in that very, very special place. Really, really special place that very few people ever reach. I put him down there with Haydn and Beethoven, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, Bob Dylan. And the Fabs. The Beatles changed everything. Dylan changed the Beatles. That's how powerful he was. Yeah. How's that for a list? Very good list, you know. I, I would I would agree with all, all of those. So so for sure. Thanks. Smokey, Smokey, Smokey was uh, Smokey changed everything. Yeah. It, 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 yeah. At the same time as the Beatles and Dylan and the Stones, Smokey was. I second that emotion, and uh, oh, the list is ridiculous. Uh, wrote, wrote as well for for you know for, for um, the tempt like a lot of the big Temptations tunes. Temps, yeah. And he wrote for all sorts of people. Uh, yeah, we, we interviewed him for part of his series. So that, that was oh, cool. yeah. Pretty cool. Yeah. Phenomenal. Yeah, and I was there. I went to Boy, see, I saw the, I saw the, I saw the uh, miracles. I saw the temptations in the, in the late sixties when I was a teenager. Didn't see the Beatles. Interestingly, I live in a very small village in Suffolk. And one of my neighbor, a friend is about my age of, former lab technician and his wife both both saw the Beatles at Hammersmith Odeon in the, uh, 64 and they weren't together they didn't know each other all right and they ha yeah they were both there they saw the fabs and they're happily married for all these years isn't that really a lovely story yeah, they that's... met one day they met and they both could say I saw the Beatles at Amazon Odeon on Thursday, the 19th of October. So did I. I mean, imagine that. <laughs> <laughs> Serendipity.